So, I guess, good evening. You are in the funding section. If you're in the wrong section, please stay. It will hurt our feelings if you leave midway through. Um, my name is David Ferguson. Uh, it's Dr. Mike Reed. I'll let him introduce himself when he speaks. Uh, we're going to be very informal. I'm probably going to give you about 10 minutes about what I do and how I'm positioned in the funding role, and then we'll progress through and have an open session for questions, comments, discussions, anything you like. So. <clears throat> Uh, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, I am about a year out of my PhD program. I am a postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine, the Department of Molecular Physiology and Biophysics, and the Children's Nutrition Research Center, which means I have a lot of letters after my name and my signature. But right now, I currently work on skeletal muscle physiology and how it's influenced by early life nutrition. And to where I got to my point in life was I did my undergraduate degree in kinesiology at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I did my master's degree at the University of North Carolina Charlotte in clinical exercise physiology and my PhD in exercise physiology at Texas A&M University. Um, so you see I've kind of traveled the board in terms of academic institutions. I've also had a rather diverse research experience, which when we talk about funding, we need to at least always talk about research. Um, I've had every job imaginable in research. I've been the glorified dishwasher. I've been the PI directing studies. I can tell you the PI is probably a little bit more stressful, but my hands aren't as chapped as they were when I was washing dishes. It's a bad joke. You can laugh at my bad joke. It's okay. Um, now, in that same context, I've been involved with a variety of research topics. I've worked on what type of microbes are on the International Space Station. I've looked at the core temperature of NASCAR pit crews. I've worked with the genetic regulation of physical activity, the proteome of a mouse soleus, and now, like I said, with what happens when you give a mouse a low-protein diet and how that programs their children for physical activity level. So a rather diverse background and a lot of different labs. And I can tell you there is one constant, funding. And the general theme right now is funding kind of sucks. Um, so what I'm going to do is I don't really have time to tell you how to apply for grants, what to do. I'm going to kind of give you some tips and tricks that I've gathered over the short terms of my career as a student and how to move forward. Okay. So to kind of start with, when I first came into research and I, people started talking about funding, I was like, I don't know what it is. I don't know why my boss is stressed out about it, but it's not really going to affect me. I can tell you that is the wrong attitude to have, because the minute I walked into my postdoc, uh, the first thing they said was, congratulations, you've been awarded an NIH T32, which is a training grant. We would now like you to apply for your own funding. So moving forward, I'm going to tell you three things I want you to remember from this. Okay, three common catchphrases, all right? First one is, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Second one is, it's good to be young. And the third is, let's go racing, okay? Do we all remember those? Okay, so let's talk a little bit, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? What's the answer to that question? You've probably heard it, right? Practice. Uh, the best thing you can do in terms of funding, whether it be whatever you're doing, practice. Practice writing grants. That's really what we're talking about, getting grants. The only way you're going to get better is to write grants and practice. I'll remember the first grant I wrote. I thought it was the best thing out there. I was sure I was going to get the Nobel Prize. I was going to retire early. I was going to buy a Ferrari and live in southern Florida. What came back to me was a document that was completely bred with the track changes with the simple comment of, I think we should start over. So <laughs> when I say practice, you need to get in the mindset of speaking very clearly to your audience. Keep in mind, a lot of people are going to read your document in addition to a lot of other documents. Now I'm talking from the standpoint of biomedical research, but this could apply to getting a fellowship for your PhD or your master's program, a teaching assistantship, or just getting funding dollars to finish your study. Speak clearly about your grant, of what you're trying to accomplish. And what I want to say is, when you practice writing grants, also practice submitting your grant. So if you write one grant, submit it to, say, one agency, submit it to another agency as well. Keep getting it out there. So whether it be a local agency, a federal agency, keep submitting and try and get practice getting out. Because what's going to happen is, let's, let's say you get rejected, you'll get feedback on what you're doing. Practice, practice, practice. Practice writing the grants, OK? Second thing is, it's good to be young. Um, any idea what that might relate to? Aside from having good knees and no heart disease. Well, we're, we're all at ACSM, so we won't have heart disease anyway. Um, 
good to be young. There's a lot of opportunities out there for young investigators or for postdocs and PhD students. Current situation is NIH and or other financial want to get um, young investigators funded. So you might have a higher opportunity of getting funded where there be a higher funding line. So where a seasoned researcher might be competing for a grant might be an 8% chance, young investigators might have 20%. Don't quote me on those numbers. If you get in the 20% denial and it's not funded, don't call me. It's just, I'm just trying to use an analogy here. So look out for those young investigator grants. Can I get an idea real fast of where are you in your career? Are we PhD students looking for postdocs? Postdocs? Yes? Master students? Masters? Looking for a PhD? Uh, getting ready to start a master's. Getting ready to start a master's. Okay. So you're looking for funding for research or funding for like a, a teaching assistantship, right? Something along those lines? Well, I'm funded right now, but I know that might not be the case forever. So. Exactly. Okay. So that leads into the next part about being young is the worst thing that can happen is when you lose funding halfway through your program. I can tell you that I've been a part of three laps. Every one of them has lost funding in the middle of my project. I don't want to admit it was my fault, but it could have been. But So that's the one thing you need to prepare for is when you're young, you have this option to get these young investigator grants or these small kind of research grants. ACSM offers a couple. The American Heart Association offers a couple as well. So I encourage you to go after those. Now the third thing I was going to talk about was let's go racing. Now, that's a rather interesting topic. I'm not going to expect you to kind of know what I'm talking about there, but I, I have a passion for automobile racing. And I started my master's program doing that, but really I've kind of transitioned into more of a skeletal muscle physiologist role right now. But I still love racing, I still kind of dabble, and I still do some research in that. And the reason I'm telling you that right now is that through the past seven years of doing this, I was awarded a $200,000 grant from the Mercedes F1 team. Now that's not National Institute of Health, that's not American Heart Association, but funding is funding, money's money. No one's gonna say, oh, racing, I, let's not take that money, let's go after something different. So, what this leads me into is if you're passionate about something, you will have a more enjoyable experience writing the grant, if you're passionate about it. I love racing. I've gone after, I've been involved in it for decades. So, it was very easy for me to write a grant about what I can accomplish, what I can do, how I can target it. And that's the other thing I want to tell you about is when you're writing a grant, target it to the question they're asking. If they want to know about hypertension, write the grant for hypertension. <coughs> so that being said, remember, practice writing your grants, go after young investigator grants, and write about something you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about it, it's going to be a miserable experience. You might as well just go to the dentist. You know, just, just save your computer time, go to the dentist. The other thing I wanted to tell you too was, I wish I had the memory to be able to remind you of this stuff, but I thought I'd give you some helpful tips here. So, I told you, there are three things we're gonna remember, right? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice your grants. It's good to be young. Go after young investigator stuff. Let's go racing. Find something you're passionate about and go after unique funding opportunities. The other thing are three websites that I want you to remember here, all right? One is American Grant Writers Association, which is www.agwa.us. They actually have online tutorials about how to formulate a grant, how to approach getting funding at all levels for master's students, PhD, postdocs, and then early career grants. Can you repeat this one? Again? Sure. www.agwa.us. And I've had great experience where I'll just email them about random questions and they get back to me within the first couple hours, which is great. The other two are more traditional forms of grant writing, such as uh, the American Heart Association, which is just www.americanheart.org. And then, of course, NIH, which offers pre- and postdoctoral training grants, which is simply grants.nih.gov. And I'll take a moment in case anyone else needs those websites. And what I kind of want to close with, because I want to have some time for discussion and questions, is my experience was I did not like grants. I did not want to write them. I wanted to avoid them as much as I could. But one of the things that I found was that, yes, it's very stressful to get funding. But when you do get funding, you can do what you want to do. Money kind of gives you autonomy. So 
I would encourage you, if you have a passion for something, to try and pursue funding for it. Uh, I wish we had more than just you know, 10, 15 minutes to talk to you about. So what I'd like to do now is take any questions you have and then turn it over to Dr. Reed and he'll kind of give you more of a faculty perspective on it. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, two. So what do you do when you're in your PhD and you do not have a lot of funding because your mentor is running out of funds? Uh -huh. It's not my fault. But I, uh -huh. need, I need um, money for clinical testing. Okay. I'm in diabetes. Okay. So I'm, I'm in there. And you know, we've, she's written like 13 grants in the last year and it's just not coming in. I mean, what options would you say go to the American Grant Association, go, go there and look for something specific? Sure. So that, that's actually something very, very common when you're trying to finish up a dissertation in your PhD program and grant funding's running out. There are a couple different routes you can take. Um, sometimes your institution will offer uh, grants to kind of finish a project, small grants, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, I would encourage you to look at those. The other option is uh, ADA, American Diabetes Association, as well as, for this is very specific to you, go after the, the cause association in a way. So, as well as Juvenile Diabetes Association. It's funny you should mention diabetes because um, I work closely with Charlie Kimball, who is a type 1 diabetic race car driver, and he's sponsored by Nova Nordist. They're actually funding research opportunities, so I would encourage you to look at them. Now, these are what you're looking for is just grants to help you finish a project, just small grants. Um, those often require just a experimental design and almost, in your case, a mentoring team. So as you're trying to finish, I would put together whether it be your mentor, some other collaborators can kind of help guide you through a research career, which you probably already have if you have a dissertation committee. I, I formed it early. Exactly, yeah, exactly. First semester. Exactly. So there's those small grants, and then uh, NIH with a F31, or a, I mean, that might be your, a little bit of a bigger grant to go after, but they're very interested in the mentoring team is how they help you build your project. So I'd encourage you to go after those. Yes. Um, what point in academic career is it normal for students to start writing grants for their own funding experience? It's getting earlier and earlier. Um, I would say start as soon as you can. Um, master's, definitely first year of your PhD program. If I had started my first year of my PhD program, I would, I would have enjoyed my career a lot more. <laughs> um, start early. Um, master's, you know, even undergrads now, there's funding for undergraduate research. And like I said, the younger you start, the more opportunities there are. So I would encourage you to start early. Any other questions? Yes. You said that you can write a grant and then submit to multiple mm -hmm. sources. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's okay. I mean, does that possibility arise where this group says, sure, you got it. This group says, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So I would love that for to happen. So get an NIH grant and an American Heart grant at the same time? That'd be that's amazing. The same proposal for the same. I mean, well, you're, pretty much, I mean, you have to tailor it to you know, what they're targeting. I mean, if you're doing heart disease, that could probably work for both, but, I mean, that would be a good question for Dr. Reed to kind of handle too. Yes? I have a question. I have an unusual situation. I have several projects. Uh-huh. It, it kind of happens, so I have 14 of them uh -huh. in the same area, and mm. um, I'm stuck with my own line of research, and I don't have any funding. Uh-huh. I'm still in my master's. I'm not a doctoral student. Uh-huh. And uh, I get actually offers of job positions related to that before I even completed it. Uh -huh. But I'm, I'm finding myself not really finding the footing uh -huh. right now. So are you trying to... F I'm trying to figure out how to proceed in this situation because I'm completely lost. I'm completely lost. Well, that's good. It's always good, you know, to be... Being somewhat lost is never good. Completely lost is the best way to start. That's a bad joke, it's okay. Um, for, from the car guy, it's okay. Um, so what I would recommend, so you, let me see if I can rephrase the question here. You're looking, you have job offers, and you're looking to move. Job offers related to the line of research that I developed, mm -hmm. but because it happened almost accidentally, I just had been thinking the entire summer, uh -huh. and all of them appeared within a month. So in my head, I just wrote them down. Okay. Time. And so you're looking to get funding for those. Is that what you're trying to ask? How to I'm hoping to get funded, but I'm also thinking about applying for doctoral work mm -hmm. and looking for the university where they would actually take my whole line. I would say go for the doctoral program. I mean, I, 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 that's probably a better question for Dr. Reed with their kind of a career development thing. But if you have a research interest and you have almost a series of studies designed, 
go to a place that will allow you to do that because what you're talking about now is you almost need to get some preliminary data, then submit for granting, and you're still in your master's trying to finish off these projects. So I would say if you're prepared and you think you can move on to the next step, I would move on to the next step. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Yes. Well, I decided to accept one of the job offers okay. for now. Okay. And to prolong my master's study so I can okay. finish at least one or two. Okay, time. sure, sure. And that would give me more time to, to look around for that whole thing. Okay. That's a good Is it? That's a good idea. I mean, if, if that's, I think that's a good step if, you're, if that's the step you've taken. I don't, I don't want to cut myself off because I want to give Dr. Reed time to talk here, but we'll transition over and then we have discussion at the end if that's all right. You're up next, I think. Thank you, David. No problem. <laughs> My name is Mike Reed. Um, brief bio. So I'm a Texas guy, born and raised. I did all of my education in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, got my PhD at UT Southwestern. Uh, went from there to Boston, where I did a postdoc and stayed on faculty for a while. Um, I was recruited from there to Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. So that's really where I rose through the ranks. I came in as sort of mid-career assistant professor and you know went through the usual academic changes there, ending up as a professor. Um, was there for 14 years, mostly focused on teaching and building a research program. And then was recruited from Baylor to University of Kentucky in 2003 to be a department chair. So I was the chair of physiology in Kentucky for about 10 years. And last year, um, left the University of Kentucky to go to the University of Florida, where I'm now the dean of the College of Health and Human Performance. So that experience has sort of constantly been woven around today's conversation regarding funding, especially training funding. Um, I have very little unique to say that David hasn't already <laughs> said. So I'm gonna spend most of my time saying he's right. Um, his experience, the first time he wrote a grant is like my experience. The first, I will never forget the walk back. So I, I rough drafted this and I, I wrote it and I, you know, I prided myself on my writing. Um, and I took it over to a guy who was a junior faculty member in our laboratory group. And he very kindly disassembled it for me and just completely shredded this grant application. And the walk back from that laboratory to my office, I, there was steam coming my, out of my ears. I was so angry at the arrogance of this guy. He was right, of course. My grant was awful. Um, but one of the things, sort of a fundamental gift that grantsmanship gives you is that if you stay in the game, and this is your choice, if you choose to be an extramurally funded investigator, it's a matter of making the decision and staying in the game. Persistence is hugely important to your success. You've got to be willing to bloody your forehead over and over and over again, and you've got to be willing to take criticism. Um, I've always thought it was a little wrong-headed for people to say, you know, you've got to be thick-skinned to survive in this. Nobody starts off thick-skinned. We all start off really sensitive about our, this is our baby. We just wrote this grant and we've been working on it. But after a while, you get to the point where you accept the criticism and you, you're still angry when you get the comments back, but you're angry for a shorter period of time. And you can see the value in the criticisms more and more frequently. So one of the advantages to pursuing extramural funding over the course of your career is that you do become a little bit less sensitive, you do become able to take criticism better, and you learn a lot. I mean, I hate to admit it, but many of these criticisms are legitimate criticisms, and I come away with a better grant, in fact, I come away with a better research experiment than I would have had otherwise. So it's, it's painful at first, but it's really valuable, and it won't kill you. And you know, to the extent that it helps, rest assured that the most senior, most successful scientist you know is getting her or his grant rejected right now, all the time. You never get beyond that. It's just part of the game. So you've got a lot of company, right? You can commiserate. If you go sit in the bar tonight after this is over and listen to all those scientists talking, they're all complaining about study section, and I can't believe that he wrote that comment in my pink sheets. So there, there are those strengths to, to writing grants. I really do think that you come, writing grants, the process of writing the scientific part of a grant is for me 
the time where I think hardest about my research and I have the most insights because I know I'm going to a room full of experts. And so I really wrestle with the literature in ways that I wouldn't do otherwise. And I wrestle with my own data and what does it mean and where is it going and what are the weak spots and where are the strong points. You learn a lot about your own work by writing grants. One of the many truisms that um, David mentioned was the importance of, in a training grant, and I think for all of you, probably the next grant you write is going to be a training grant. Half the grant is the science, and only half the grant. That doesn't mean you can slack off on that half of the grant. It still has to be outstanding science. But in addition to that, you have to have the second half of the grant is about the training experience. And um, this young lady mentioned the fact that she already had a team assembled of mentors. That's really important to have structure in your training program, to have mentors that are good. They have to be funded investigators. If you have a team full of mentors who aren't themselves funded, then they're not going to carry the same weight that mentors would carry otherwise. So building that training aspect of the grant is as important as building the scientific part of the grant. Like David, as an undergrad, I was on a training grant. So I was one of the chosen. I was very pleased with that. It gave me a false sense of security. I then went to a postdoctoral environment where I was on a training grant. So I didn't have to really write my own grants. I wrote one grant when I was moving from graduate to postdoc, and it didn't get funded by the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And I didn't write another grant until I was competing for an R01. Well, that's way too late. So let me talk a little bit from the, the sort of administrative perspective, faculty perspective, some things that can be really helpful to you as a, as a trainee. All of you have a lab now, you have a mentor now, you, many of you have projects now, but you will be looking ahead perhaps to a PhD program, maybe, or perhaps to a postdoctoral opportunity. When that happens, aim high. If you want to be a scientist and you want to be a funded investigator, work with people who are good at that. Don't go work for a, a laboratory that's not funded. Don't go to a group where funding is relatively uncommon, even if it's your favorite school or even if it's right next to your best friend. If you want to be a scientist, suck it up and find the best laboratory you can get into and learn from people who know how to do this. It's an art and a craft. And if you immerse yourself in that environment, you pick it up almost by diffusion. You hear people talking about it in the lunchroom and around the hallways, and you, you begin to accept it as the way life is. And, and you don't think about it anymore, and you don't whine about it anymore, and you don't complain about it. It's just the way it is. The postdoc and initial assistant professorship, I was in a, a group at Harvard. There were 40 people in the group. One person had tenure. Everybody else was on 100% soft money. That's just, it was just the reality, and that's the way we lived, and we were used to that. So when I left that environment and I went to Baylor College of Medicine, I was in a clinical department. PhDs in clinical departments better be paying their way. So as an assistant and an associate professor, I had 95% of my salary on soft money off of grants. And that was okay with me because I'd grown up in an environment where we just, that's just how you lived. It's the way it worked. It's possible to do that. It's not impossible. It sounds challenging. And maybe it's challenging, but if you grow up in that environment, if you're used to that, you'll be much better prepared to compete for that sort of um, career. Before you get to your faculty position, before you're thinking about tenure, at this point in your life, you have to be thinking, what can I do to make myself a grant, better grants person? I really liked what David suggested with these, the, these grant, these websites that you can go to to get information. Seek information wherever you can get it. Ask your mentor for, the abil for, the, for permission to write a grant. And when you get permission to write a grant, ask for criticism from the best, smartest Debbie, Debbie, scientists Debbie. who you can get to listen to you. Begin working at this craft, and the sooner the better you start That's doing it. it. Somebody asks, when is the earliest you can write a That's grant? It. I've had undergrads who've written grants, you know? And you can get funded as an undergrad. And the more grants you've succeeded at, the more attractive you are to the next job or the next training position. If you show up, and so there's a stack of, a stack of applications for a postdoctoral fellowship. Well, as the leader of a training grant, I'm going to look at those applicants, and if one of them has already written a successful grant, then that tells me that that person comes from a serious environment, that person's got their head up, that person gets it, 
and so I'm going to be much more likely to bring them onto my training grant. Um, if I'm hiring an entry-level assistant professor who has competed for grants, even if you haven't gotten a grant, if you've competed for grants and you show up to interview for a faculty position and you can talk about, you know, I competed for this and here's what my scores were and here's how I'm responding to it and here's how I'm thinking about it and I'm going back in, it shows that you're serious. It shows that you have your head in the game. So I urge you, as soon as you are able to do so, to begin thinking in terms of grants, thinking about your project in terms of specific aims, thinking in terms of pilot data for the next grant application you might be writing. All of these are fundamental survival skills. Um, in, how many PhD students do we have? A lot, that's terrific. So among those of you, sorry? Sorry, I asked how many PhD students there were and you're not there yet, soon. <laughs> so among those of you who are PhD students, how many of you write your qualifying exams in the, in the format of a grant application? A few hands? That's becoming more and more common, is that you'll write it as a grant application. And then you've got a rough draft of a grant that can be submitted. So at our uh, physiology program in Kentucky, one of the things that we instituted was a grantsmanship course for all of our PhD students. They all, they had to take it, they're obligated. And in that grantsmanship course, you had to begin writing grants. So you're writing a grant, you're being critiqued by graduates, you're, by faculty, and you take that skill then and you can apply that skill in your qualifying exams and you can take that qualifying exam and tweak it further and, and apply for an individual training grant as a PhD student and, you know, sort of half of our students got their own grants before they graduated, which was pretty cool. I think it's because they had the benefit of that mentoring. To the extent you can practice and to the extent that you can get mentoring, you're much more likely to be successful. I urge you to do it. Um, what else? <laughs> um, anything to look for when you review a grant, maybe? Pardon me? When you review a grant from a trainee, anything you look for that stands out? Yeah, when you review a trainee, a, a, a grant from a trainee, what are you looking for? The, the bad news is everything. I want to see, if, if you've got misspellings and your grammar is bad and you can't construct sentences, forget it. Don't even send it in. So you have to have, you have, to have excellent English skills. If English isn't your first language, don't worry. Get help. Ask for help with editing. If you're like me and you're from Texas and your English is awful, get somebody to help you, right? Um, clarity in writing it's been is important. About a half an hour, sorry to interrupt, um, but we're going to go ahead and allow you to switch groups. You're more than welcome to stay in the group you're in right now, um, but now's your time to switch groups. At the end, you can come back and speak to the presenters. Um, but now's your chance to switch groups, and we'll do one more switch at about 6:30. Um, so go ahead and rotate now. If you'd like, if not, hold tight, and we'll get started in just a minute or two. Guys, I preached too long. I'm sorry for that. If, if you want to stick around, we'll do questions and answers for a few minutes. Is that yeah. right, David? Yeah. 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 But if you need to change sessions, I totally understand. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. All right, so why don't I shut up? No, no. <laughs> Question and answer. <laughs> that would be better. What? Questions. My name is Katie Smith. I'm currently a PhD student at Iowa State University. Defended two weeks ago, so I'm in the revision stage now, finishing up there. And then I will finish my clinical rotations this summer to become an RD, a registered dietitian. Um, then we, I will let him introduce himself, and then after that we're going to kind of give you a little bit more detail about our background relevant to internship experiences, and then we'll open it up to questions. But by all means, feel free to interrupt us along the way if you think of a question so that you don't forget it and just ask then. So. My name is Steve Martin. I'm a clinical associate professor at Texas A&M University. So I have my background in cardiac rehab. I did my undergraduate um, work at Ohio State University and then went on to do both my master's and my PhD at Texas A&M. But my background is in cardiac rehab, cardiovascular physiology, and then I oversee our student internship program uh, with our undergraduate students at Texas A&M. Do you want to kick it off again? Yeah, so I did my undergraduate degree at Simpson College, which is a small private liberal arts school just south of Des Moines, Iowa. 
only has about 1,500 students, and I only graduated with 16 from high school, so I didn't even look at big schools when I was looking at schools. Um, I majored in athletic training and exercise science. I loved sports and I loved medicine. I thought that was a great combination of the two and thought I would forever be in the field of athletic training, and I don't even do anything really related to it at all anymore. Um, about two and a half years, three years in, I realized it really was not exactly what I intended as far as what a schedule would allow for flexibility into the future. And I started to realize that I didn't know near as much about nutrition as what I felt I needed to know in order to be valuable to the clientele that I was working with. So I knew that I wanted to go on and pursue graduate school. And so when I started looking at graduate schools, I looked at graduate programs that I could focus on nutrition for the coursework, but I still wanted to be able to involve exercise and physical activity in my research. Um, I had a personal interest in pregnancy and I explored medical school for a while but I realized that really wasn't what I was looking for either. So to further break down my graduate school um, work, I was trying to find someone that ultimately was going to be working in the area of exercise and pregnancy or nutrition in pregnancy, um, but that really narrowed down my choices. So I thought I would go far away for school. I'm originally from Northwest Iowa and I ended up with graduate school an hour closer to home in central Iowa rather than further away. But it had a nutrition program that was interdisciplinary that allowed me to combine kinesiology and nutrition and do work with someone that was doing work in pregnancy. So that's my little tip for finding a graduate school program is look for the content area um, that you want to actually learn to be able to take to the next phase of life. And that kind of ties into our talk about internships in terms of looking at, when you're looking at internships, really think about the skill set that you want to take away from that internship. So, you know, is, ask them, are you going to be doing more than just actually observing? Are you going to actually be able to learn new skills that you can't do right now? Because you want to be able to build upon what you've learned in the classroom and now become proficient in those so that when you apply for either your next internship or graduate school or a job, you're actually able to walk in and start doing those things from day one. So I did two internships during my undergraduate program. I did one my sophomore year in cardiac rehab in a hospital. It was more phase two, phase three cardiac rehab um, than it was actually inpatient. But I realized very quickly that that was not at all what I wanted to do. It was a valuable experience, even though I was excited for it to, <laughs> to be done with so I could go on to my next internship, because I realized it really wasn't for me. Um, so that was time well spent in and of itself. The second internship that I did then was with corporate fitness, and it was between my junior and my senior year of college. And both of my internships I got from knowing people and just contacting people and asking if they took interns. So I know some of your programs are a little bit different. You may not have the ability to actually choose your own internship, but I was able to do that, which is good and bad because it puts a little stress on you to be able to find those contacts. But essentially it, what I did was when I was a freshman, I had to observe senior athletic training students. And so we rotated through multiple different sports. And I had just so happened to hear, you know, your colleges will do highlights on recent alum. And so someone had highlighted that one of our interns had now been hired by the White House Athletic Center to be their corporate fitness director. So I thought, wow, that sounds like a pretty cool place to try and do an internship. And I remembered her because I observed her during the football rotation my freshman year when she was a senior. So I got her contact information, sent her an email, and just asked if her company took interns, and they did. So the company actually is nationwide. And so what they do is the company has contracts with several different government offices to run their fitness centers within their facility. So I interviewed with the company for an internship position and was offered a position within the Department of Justice at one of their facilities that actually houses all of the U.S. Attorney Generals and the U.S. Marshals. So I spent a summer out in D.C. personal training and teaching group exercise classes and doing health promotion to U.S. Attorney Generals and U.S. Marshals. So when I came back, I didn't really have much personal training experience or teaching group X when I went out there. But when I came back, now I was returning to the job that I had before during college, which was working at an Anytime Fitness, and was able to bring all of that to the facility. And actually, a few months after I came back to that facility, our head personal trainer, or the manager in charge of personal training, left to go somewhere else. So even though I wasn't finished with school, the owner looked at me and said, well, you just came back from training our U.S. Marshals and Attorney Generals. I think you're most fulfilled to complete this role. It's now yours. <laughs> so I stepped up into a management role my senior year of college 
based on the experience and the skill set that I learned as an intern. So um, one thing that I would say is really learn to set yourself apart. So right now, a, you know, a degree is very important, obviously, I'm not going to downplay that, but essentially it's going to be a minimum qualification for a job. It's a requirement, it's not even something extra that they're going to look at most of the time. You won't even get looked at without your degree. So you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do to set yourself apart from every other applicant? So whether that's research experience, which I would highly recommend, and I'll come back to that in a second, or it's volunteer work because you've tried to explore several different areas and you've put in time to try and figure out what exactly it is that you want to do. Um, it's another job, whatever it may be, your internships exactly. Some of these concepts apply for both trying to find an internship or trying to find a job. They're very connected. Um, but essentially, you have to figure out how you're going to make a name for yourself. So don't just go through the motions of school. Don't just try to you know, get through this test, try to just get to graduation. Try to make a name for yourself along the way. Because if you're going to use your advisor as a reference and then an internship or a job calls back, what are they going to remember you as when they've had you know, 300 students in the last year since you left? How are they going to remember you? So really make that name for yourself. So coming back to the research point, if you have an opportunity to get involved with research, I highly recommend that you do that. Even if you're not interested in actually doing research for a career, if you're interested in the field of health, wellness, or medicine, which I would assume that we probably all are if we're at this conference, you're going to be able to have to navigate the literature in your job in the future. Whether you're a doctor, you're a PT, you're an OT, you're a personal trainer, you're an academic, whatever it is, you have to know what the latest literature supports. So if you understand the research process and you're able to know what a good study design is, you know, what, was this study done well and can I actually trust the conclusions that they're making from it? And so now you're reading a study and 10 years into your practice you're thinking, or even your first year when you're just starting out, it's all the same, that you really need to be able to read the literature and say, oh yeah, you know, this is what they did. They found that this really protects, you know, high school girls from tearing their ACL. This is something that we want to implement in our clinic or we want to implement in our training program to see if this works or vice versa. Actually, no, look at the study design. They didn't do X, Y, and Z. They didn't have this set up. They should have done it this way. Why, they don't provide any evidence to say that this is the way that this is, you know, this should have been done like this. And so, no, I'm not going to change the way that we do things based on this study. So you can read lots of different <laughs> articles, but you really have to be able to analyze them critically to develop your own clinical judgment. And that comes back to being able to understand research and how research is done. So again, even if you don't want to do it yourself, you're going to have to be able to navigate the literature in your job. So try to get involved in research. Um, that's a very good way to enhance your resume. And I will leave it at that for right now, and I'll let him talk, and then we'll kind of tag team a little bit in the end. Okay. And I'll start with uh, a little bit about our undergraduate program at Texas A&M. Our students have to complete an internship to graduate and complete their graduation requirements. We have a set bank of internship sites that are already established, so they can choose from. Now we have a great amount of variety in different cities in Austin, Dallas, Houston, everything from cardiovascular rehab to general corporate fitness. We have students that are interested in strength and conditioning. We've got strength and conditioning internships with TCU, with Uni uh, University of Houston, with our own program. So we've got a little bit of variety of students to choose from, but they're limited to what we have on file is active that we have actual contracts with with our legal department and of course the hospitals, the clinics, the different sites. Uh, which makes it hard because students will come to us and say, oh, I really, you know, can we add this? Uh, some people here are able to go out and get their own internships and, and that's great. Uh, I will say when you're deciding on an internship site, you need to think about the ultimate goals to gain employment, to get a job. Uh, pick an internship site that hopefully will benefit you after you get finished and maybe lead to some employment. So I'll ask, you know, our students will come and say, hey, can you give me some advice? I'm, I'm tossing and debating between you know corporate fitness or cardiovascular rehab you know and some of the advice I'll give them I'll say all of you coming through our undergraduate program everybody should be able to work with healthy population right off the bat I mean, that's what you get in your core classes I'd expect you all to go out and be able to to personal train and to prescribe exercise and work with people that are healthy I said the opposite isn't true with the special populations. So getting that three month or that semester internship in cardiac rehab is gonna set you apart a little bit 
Now, some of them don't know necessarily if that's what they want to continue. And, and I don't know if I see myself working cardiac rehab, you know, five, six years down the line. But what I'll tell them is, you know, it's a semester. Uh, the amount of experience that you'll be able to gain and take away from that is going to be unique. And I said, and it might come back and help you when you're looking for employment down the road when there is a particular job that might come open in cardiac rehab. And it might be six, seven months later and you've gone through and did an internship now and you can go apply versus somebody that may have chosen the corporate fitness track and now is looking and hasn't found a job and like, oh, well, there's something that's cardiac rehab. Maybe I'll see if I can get hired and apply for that job. I can tell you, you know, who do you think they're going to choose when they've got somebody that, you know, oh, this person's got a semester of experience already in cardiac rehab versus somebody that has never stepped foot into a cardiovascular clinic they're gonna go with a student that has that experience. So even if it's, I tell them that you may not think you wanna do that down the road, you know, I don't think you could pass up that experience. And like Katie said, you'll know right away whether or not that's what you like. And, and some of those cardiovascular rehab you know, appointments um, are, have some, are multifaceted where you can actually get some exposure to inpatient cardiac rehab, outpatient cardiac rehab, and some sites actually have some stress testing exposure. So you get a, you know, you spend maybe you know, a month in each and you get to rotate and it kind of keeps things fresh as opposed to going with one site and all you're going to be doing is a stress testing clinic and all you do is stress test for you know, that semester. Gives you a little bit more variety. I'll say you're going to pick up different skill sets that hopefully you'll take information from that and make you more marketable when you get out and you start applying for jobs. And now you say, well, I've been exposed to this or I've participated in this skill and, and that'll make you a little bit more marketable. So I think, you know, you need to think along those lines and you'll know right away whether or not you like inpatient cardiac rehab or not. And that, that's good in a way. If you decide that you don't like it, well, now then you know that, that, that you're not exposed and you're not going to do that when you look down in the future. Uh, second thing is they're becoming more competitive. So now not only you're competing amongst your fellow students and as the programs start to increase in number, now you're going to compete from other schools. Now you've got competition. So I think you need to make yourself, before you get to that stage, as marketable as you can. Certifications, as many certifications as you can and, and amount of exposure that you get at your institutions that you can take with now in the interview process when you sit and try to get an, uh, an interview for an internship site. So we'll have some that, you know, the site may only takes two students. And we may have four students that all want to go to this one site. And so it's competitive. Now, the way we handle it is we go back and we look at their grades for the different coursework. And then we'll get the people with the highest grades. We'll get the option to get the first chance to apply. But they're also now, we find that they're competing with other schools. Now our schools, have, uh, our program is more clinically based. So they have exposure already coming out, performing stress tests. Um, actually working with mock cardiac rehab patients uh, as opposed to other schools that have come in that have never, the student has never taken a blood pressure in their life and they're there to learn so they're, they're a little bit you know, ahead of the game in that respect. But now you're starting to see more competition. So I think what Katie mentioned too is you need to treat it, do your research, find a site and you need to be selective too. Unfortunately for our students we kind of pick a top three you know, as far as their first, second, third choice, and we kind of direct them as we need you to go ahead and, and apply here. But if you have the option, this is going to be something that's going to help benefit your career. Just like a job, you pick two or three different, you know, facilities that seem very interested to you. Do some research, find out, number one, staffing, who's there. It might be somebody that's well known. What type of equipment or what type of programs do they offer? Something that, again, you can add to your skill set. I've never, you know, performed, you know, metabolic testing before. I've never done, you know, max VO2 testing before. I'd like to learn that. Well, oh, this, this particular internship site, you know, that's a facet of their program. So when you go into your interview, you want to, you know, incorporate that and express your interest in learning that skill. And it's something that you hope that you know you could take away from that. Second thing too is what you can bring to the table and as much exposure in your undergraduate career that you can get maybe volunteering within your own department and, and actually I'm sure there's probably somebody in your department that might be performing stress tests that you can kind of watch and anything that you can any skill that you can pick up that you can take with you say well you know I've been volunteering or I've exposed to this particular skill at my program here, they might be more inclined to give you the nod versus somebody else. So I definitely think that you need to start you know, looking at that and be selective. After you go through two or three different facilities and then you make the decision on what's right for you as opposed to just going with one, one facility. 
and then you know, definitely because it's going to be your choice and you want to get the most out of that semester, that three months that you possibly can. We can only teach you so much you know, with the coursework and bringing our, you know, past clinical experiences in and giving you information. But I can go back to my own experiences as an undergrad and the internship site and the amount of, of knowledge and, and what you pull from that internship experience, I still quote and, and cite back to my students today. So that's something that, you know, you definitely, the more you get out of that, the better off you're gonna be. Downside is most of them aren't paid. Uh, so don't go talking to you know your friends in business and, and engineering who are getting you know thirty forty thousand dollar paid internships. But I will tell you for our students we see number one that that may lead to a direct job. So that's your interview right there. You're three months into a into a position. If you don't you know if you don't burn any bridges and you do really well and you're a great qualified student, the odds are that if there's a position that opens up that you're going to get the nod. And we've seen that a lot with our students. The second thing is if that's not the case, and then the, based on the economy, if there's not a position open in your particular site where you interned, all the supervisors, everybody keeps in touch. And it might not be a job with your facility, but it might be something that you, that supervisor knows, another supervisor you know, over in Dallas, let's say, that has a, a cardiac rehab position that might be opening up and will direct you and put in a good word for you, because a lot of it is, is who you know in, in the field. And that might be your lead uh, and your nod to get a position. And that's how I got my first position. It wasn't with St. Luke's in the Medical Center. It was cardiac rehab at St. Elizabeth in Beaumont that my supervisor knew the supervisor there and contacted me four months after I, you know, I was working construction. And hey, she called me out of the blue and said, hey, I think there's a position open. You know, here's this person's contact information. Give them a call, tell them I sent, you know, gave your information and apply. And that's how I got my first job. So that's a lot of what I tell my students. Uh, when they're completing their internship. Uh, again, don't burn any bridges you know, while there if you don't like, and, and there's going to be some conflicts with personalities and that and I will say, you know, definitely you, you want to leave your institution, you're representing your institution in, in good hands. I've seen both ends of that. I've seen a student that, you know, had some conflicts and, you know, potentially lose now an internship site at Michael Johnson Sports Center because that student, you know, left early and, and never emailed the, their supervisor and then they come back to us and, well, what's wrong with your student? So you definitely you never know down the road uh, when you're also looking for positions where that person that you were working with and you didn't necessarily get along with might be a, a supervisor and might be hiring. So one of the things that you kind of take with you and, and take into consideration. Second thing too is in involvement when you're in most internship sites, you have to pick a research pro or a project per se, not research. But if you're thinking about professional school uh, or medical school, that if you might be able to get involved in some sort of research project that's going on in your internship site and become a part of that and maybe get your name on an abstract or get your name on a publication per se uh, during that semester that looks really good on interview uh, groups with medical schools and PT schools and I've, I've had colleagues that are on those positions contact me and say yeah we're real impressed with their you know research involvement at, you know at that undergraduate level uh, some of the times when I've taken on interns with our own program we'll all, and I'll almost always try to get them involved in some research project that we have going on in the lab, whether it be the hands-on grunt work or, you know, the ability to, you know, help, you know, do some writing. And we'll have them actually work on posters and actually present at Student Research Week. So they're able to add this all now on their resumes and put that on there that they were involved in actually, you know, and some of them will get a publication if they're on a poster here at ACSM that we submit. So to be able to say that and list that on your resumes if you're applying for med school or PT school or that, you know, a lot of times that does, uh, that does get the nod and, and people are very impressed with that. So what questions do you guys have at this point? Fire you did away. that good of a job? No, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Sure. I'm a doctoral student um, and I'm testing the nutrition department, and, uh -huh. um, but I did exercise physiology research prior to, so I'm interested in keeping the two together, and I'm mm -hmm. also interested in the registered dietitian credential. Um, at mm -hmm. this point, I haven't taken any of the didactic coursework, and so I've talked to many people about, you know, are you set with a PhD? Should you look into PhD RD? What about the timing in terms of courses in your internship when you're kind of mm -hmm. focused on your research work? So I know that's kind of a specific question, and we can talk afterward. Sure. Um, if you want to do more about it, just kind of a general recommendation for you know, um, or no RD. How far are you? You just started your program? Yeah, I'll transition into the program for going into the fall. Um, just finishing up. 
Okay, is there anyone else that's interested in nutrition? Not okay. nutrition, but the um, idea of going from uh, PhD into a more applied field. That took, uh, I'm, a, I'm a science physiologist myself, but mm -hmm. I think it's the same way I'm doing a PhD in order to basically build up, I wouldn't say to just build my resume, but it is, it is a part of it to get the research experience, to enjoy the research, to get, ultimately to get a job in the applied field, leaving from the PhD. So. Right. I so, did that. Yeah, I always thought that I first, you know, that I would end up in an academic setting that I really enjoyed teaching. Um, but the reason that I chose nutrition for graduate school was because I'd been practicing and working with clients and felt like I didn't know enough about it, so I needed to learn more about that. Um, and then I didn't ever have any intentions of doing the RD because to me an RD was just meal planning at a long-term care center and I wanted nothing to do with that. I wanted to learn more just about, about how to make my clients healthier with nutrition. Um, but it wasn't really until I got into the nutrition science coursework that I realized it's really biochemistry focused, metabolism, physiology focused, and that means something to us but that information in and of itself means nothing to the clientele or to the people that I'm going to be working with. And that practical application is what I found was in the didactic RD coursework. And so that's why I decided to pursue that track was because I always, I came from a practical application background. So to me, it's always relating myself of, you know, even simple, something as simple as nutrients, you know, so we tell someone to have this, you know, 23, try to be under 23 milligrams of sodium or eat this many calories a day. Well, I work with some people that don't know what a calorie is or, to, you know, this many milligrams of a certain nutrient mean nothing to them. They don't eat nutrients, they eat food. So you have to be able to translate what you know science to, you know, helpful information to your consumers. But there is a very big shortage of PhD RDs. Um, and so regardless of whether you're interested in academics or what you're going to do into the future, um, PhD RDs are starting to actually open up more opportunities for you to become credentialed because they are um, in such severe demand. So we can talk a little bit more specifics about that afterwards. But in general, that's the practical bridge of why I chose to do that. So PhD RD, but now that's in Australia, what's that? Um, it's a registered dietitian that has a PhD. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of credentialing differences with, uh, with certifications and, and working in Australia versus uh, versus over here. We've looked at it with the um, clinical exercise physiology program. But I would say uh, for you two uh, certifications, you know, as far as if you're getting your PhD, I have my PhD, I've got my RCEP that I've got. So if you wanted to go and, and go back in, in the applied arena, you know, I think that's important. And it, it's only going to benefit you on if you stay in academia, because if you get in with our program, now I focus a lot of what I teach our students and, and our undergraduate students and prep them for the coursework and what's to expect on, on that test, which is a master's level test. So their undergraduate now curriculum is becoming that much more advanced and, and more beneficial. So if you end up going that route, that's, a, that's only a plus. What other questions do you have? Don't feel the need to, to stick with your, your, your department's curriculum, too. I've had a student that just went out on his own. He wasn't taking classes in a semester and, and, and picked out an internship. It wasn't through the university, but it was on his own. And he was doing corporate fitness with Apple uh, in Austin, Texas. And that might be something that, you know, those type of things that might be setting the groundwork for later on, whatever he decides to do. And then he's going to have to complete an official one for his master's program. Uh, and they're not one of the, the sites, but uh, you know that's the difference between you going out and if you're allowed to get your own internship site versus your you know department that has a set bank of these are the sites that are are active. You have to choose from from these. Nothing stopping you on your own. Same with strength and conditioning. If any of you are interested in that, many many internships, uh, unpaid and 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 volunteered in order to just get your name out there and, and get well known and, and hopefully land a job eventually. So more than one, more than two sometimes. It can be frustrating, you know, a lot of things that I hear from students are, how am I supposed to get that experience? Because whether you're applying for your internship or for your job, a lot of the qualifications are two to three years of experience. Well, <laughs> isn't my internship supposed to be where I get that experience, right? You so count that. And it can, be, it can be tough, but it does come back to volunteering. So you may have to do work without pay, 
but just to be in the setting. And sometimes it may not even be that you're volunteering. Say you're volunteering in the hospital and you're just sitting with patients that don't have friends or family nearby to visit them while they're in the hospital. You're keeping them company. You're keeping them, you know, their morale up. But you've got your foot in the door with a hospital as a volunteer. So if you wanted to go in and observe in, you know, inpatient physical therapy or inpatient cardiac rehab, you've been within a hospital setting. And sometimes that, you know, is just enough to set you apart from the next person. So just, yeah, again, coming back to that volunteer work sometimes if you need experience or contacting a place and just saying, maybe you have to fold towels. I mean, as a volunteer, you don't have to, they're probably not gonna let you put your hands on a patient. Maybe they will, depending on the facility. Um, but it, yeah, you might just be doing laundry or um, something very simple, but all of that will eventually add up and you've gotta start somewhere. Cause again, you're just making yourself known and making connections and networking because as I said before both internships were because I knew people and I just asked or someone knew someone else so it's really come it's a small world so again don't burn any bridges <laughs> no matter where you go and think about yourself for your future if you're thinking about ACSM certifications you know for the RCEP you're required to have a certain number of hours experience hours in various clinical population settings. So when you're down there choosing your undergraduate internship, if you, if you have the option of choosing a clinically based internship versus, oh, well, I think I'm just gonna go, it's, it's easy, I use corporate fitness, I'll just go work at this you know, facility. Now you're losing out on, on the ability to, to mount up and, and accumulate some hours that are potentially working with pulmonary rehab, cardiac rehab, which are required. You have to list that. If you go down the road and get your graduate degree and then now you wanna sit and take an exam, and the same thing with our students that want to go into physical therapy. You don't necessarily have to do an internship in physical therapy to apply to physical therapy school. Because what Katie said, our students are finding out right now, they're not allowed to put their hands on patients. They're spending the whole semester just sitting there watching the physical therapist and reading research articles where I've had students that'll go and, and do a clinical hospital-based cardiac rehab internship and are getting into PT school. And we'll come back and say when it's time, say just, our, just the cardiovascular cardiovascular section that they learned in our in undergraduate plus their internship is their way ahead of the game and other PT students when they're actually in their PT programs. So do your research on your yeah. internships. Find out what it is that you're actually going to be doing as part of the internship because some interns I know unfortunately have the experience of being the ones that have to fold the towels and just clean for their facility and you know that maybe that's the only thing that you have available to you in your area but hopefully you can find something that you're actually going to be able to expand your skill set on because you want to be able to use your preceptors as references in the future and it's really difficult to write a strong letter of reference on someone who really only had to fold towels so i can say that you showed up and you were on time and that you were pleasant to be around um, but i don't have anything else to judge my skill set on so if that's the only thing the facility can offer hopefully you can find something else that's really going to set you apart. And they want to see some initiative and see, see you actually, you know, inquire and ask about uh, doing more. And I've, I've heard that too, is it, and, unless you ask, sometimes there's some people that are so busy, they're just going to let you sit there and shadow and, and observe and they'll come back and say, well, they never showed any initiative or any, you know, as far as students say, you know, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone, you know, if you're, thinking it's to a new experience and say, well, you know, I've never done this before. Don't just sit around and, and sit and just watch and say, hey, I'd like to try that. And here's where you know, you've got now somebody that's, that's you know, that's their background area. They're there to kind of watch you and, and help make corrections and give you advice. And all of a sudden now all this information starts flowing and, and you start retaining a lot more experience from something that you may never thought about doing uh, or were, were maybe more nervous about doing. And if you find yourself in a situation like that where you're really just having to observe and not being able to do some of the things that you really maybe were told that you were going to be able to do, then think of something that your facility could use or that you could develop that would be helpful to them. So again, yeah. get outside of your comfort zone. Maybe it's just developing a bulletin board in the waiting area about you know, a recipe of the week or an exor a new exercise to try or um, you know, exploring the new fad diet, you know, the pros and the cons or debating whatever it is that they saw on the Today Show that morning or Dr. Oz and actually bringing the science to them. You know, just be creative and think of something simple like that. And again, that will be something that your preceptors will remember and like, yeah, they really took the initiative to try to develop something new for our facility. So it could be something that's really unrelated, that may not be related to hands-on patient care, but you are trying to at least explore other options and be unique.
that trigger any questions for any of you? Okay. Well, it is seven, well, after seven, so if you are um, inching to go, you're more than welcome, but we will stick around for more questions one-on-one. -on -one. So thanks for coming. And if you want to fill out your evals, you can leave them with us and I can turn them in, um, or you can just leave them in a chair by the door and we'll, yeah, I think we'll turn them in for you. She's walking around. That might make it way up here. <laughs> <laughs>